um, just classical fields, which we sort of generally been labeling in the following way, just meaning some, some generic fields. And um, there's a few things I, I just want to stress again. I said them yesterday. I, I'm just going to keep reminding you because it's, it, it's really important to stress this difference between quantum mechanics and, and quantum field theory. So the first thing is that, that the dynamical degrees of freedom are the values of phi at every single point. Okay, that, that's what we're interested in. And, uh, and phi is something real, you know, it's something physical. You could think of it as, as, as temperature in certain cases. It's going to be a little more abstract than that when we come to quantize it. But, you know, it's something that you could measure its value at every single point in space. Okay, that, that's the dynamical object. The guy X here is just a label which tells you which di dynamical degree of freedom you're interested in. Is it the value of the field at this point in space or the value of the field at this point in space? And so on. Okay, it's important to stress this because it's really a, a change from what you're used to in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, the dynamical degree of freedom is the position of, of the particle. That position gets changed into an operator. Here, x is not going to be changed into an operator at all. It's always just going to stay a label. Okay? The second thing to stress is that, as we've seen, this guy phi sometimes obeys equations which look like equations you've seen before. Schrodinger equations, Klein-Gordon equations. But phi never has the interpretation of a wave function. Okay? It's just not a wave function. This is classical field theory we're talking about for now. There's no quantum mechanics. Again, this is just some physical uh, object which is obeying certain equations that's saying how it moves. Okay? Is that, is that good with everybody? Uh, any questions about, about this? Please. No, no, the, the, the five fields have a Lagrangian, and that Lagrangian includes certain terms, and one of those terms has a coefficient that I've called M. <laughs> okay. It, it is going to be a mass, but... No, 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 no. So, so that's exactly why I don't want to call it mass yet. We'll quantize, we'll see what it, exactly what it's the mass of. And now it's just a coefficient in that Lagrangian. Other questions? No? Good. So, what I want to tell you in this lecture is, is more about classical field theory. And in particular, I want to focus on symmetries of classical field theory. So the first symmetry I'm going to talk about is just Lorentz symmetry, and in particular what we mean by by Lorentz symmetry. The, the reason is that certainly if you're a particle physicist, the whole reason to do quantum field theory is to develop a, a relativistic version of quantum mechanics. Okay, so that's mixing quantum mechanics with special relativity to get a Lorentz invariant uh, theory. So I want to tell you how you write down Lagrangians that describe field theories that are invariant under Lorentz transformations, so consistent with special relativity. So, Lorentz transformations. So we want to construct relativistic field theories with time and space placed on equal footing. Okay, uh, what this really means is that the theory should be invariant under Lorentz transformation.
Okay, so I'm going to use the following um, notation for, for Lorentz transformations. Um, are people happy with this? I'm going to give some examples shortly, but is there anybody who just hasn't seen this kind of equation before? Just have GR, yeah? So it's all good. Good, so, so what's going on here? You take a point x, we're going to do a Lorentz transformation to move it to a point x prime. x prime is related to the original x by multiplying by this matrix. Um, sort of fairly abstractly, this matrix is a member of the group SO3, comma 1. What that means in uh, practice is that it obeys the following equation. Sigma tau lambda mu tau mu nu. Okay, so any matrix, uh, capital lambda, which obeys the following equation where eta, of course, is the Minkowski metric here, is a Lorentz transformation. So just some examples. No, I, th I think it's exactly as it is. It, it's really a transpose already, precisely be because of the way the indices are, are contracting. Okay? So, so, so these, if, if you think about the group SON, what's the definition of SON? It's a rotation matrix which, is, which obeys R times R transpose is equal to the, the unit matrix. Okay? This is morally the same as that. It's lambda times lambda transpose is unit matrix, but, but there's unit matrices here which are really the Minkowski metric with these minus signs. Is that, is that clear? Uh, lost the uh, board in really some. It's the first thing that is that. Here. Okay, so, so you're happy with this? This is a kind of uh, Lorentz transformation that's just a familiar rotation. Rotates us around the z axis by an angle theta. Uh, another example. Okay, so this is now an example of a boost along the x-axis. By the way, implicit here is the fact that this is time x, y, z. Uh, so just a boost along the x-axis, velocity v, where gamma is this usual relativistic gamma factor. You could also write this in terms of costs and cinches, if you preferred. Okay, so, so this is how the Lorentz transformations act on the underlying space on Minkowski space. They, you, they take one point to another point under, under a transformation. But what we're really interested in is how they act on the fields that are living over this space. And mathematically, what we need is a representation of the Lorentz group on the fields. Um, what that means in a more mundane way is you take the field and you look to see what indices are floating around that sort of tells you whether it's a scalar field or a vector field, or we'll see later a spinner field. Okay. So in this course, we're going to um, 
consider all these three different representations of the Lorentz group, scalar, vector, and, and spinner. Um, but for now, we're just going to keep with the simplest one, which is a scalar field. And a scalar field basically doesn't transform under, um, uh, under the Lorentz group, except in sort of a trivial fashion. And although it's trivial, it's really confusing. So I'm going to write it down, and then I'm going to try and explain it to you. But it's the kind of thing that's really best done in the privacy of your own home when nobody else is looking. Uh, so I'll try and explain, but you should try and figure this out for yourselves. OK, so the Lorentz transformations um, have a representation on fields. And for a scalar field, this is Okay, so this is how it transforms, and the subtle part is the fact that this is a, a lambda to the minus one here, and not a lambda, okay? So this is all to do with the difference between active and passive transformations. In practice, it really doesn't matter whether you're doing an active or a passive transformation, or whether you put a lambda or a lambda to the minus one there, as long as you're consistent. But if it's an active transformation, it's correct to put lambda to the minus one. So let me just try and explain why this is, but, but like I said, it's the kind of thing that everybody understands in their own way, and if I explain it in the way I understand it, you, it might just confuse you. So I'll do my best, and then you can go away and figure it out, okay? So this is an active transformation that, yeah, please. So the difference doesn't matter, and it seems clear that it doesn't matter. Why, like, is there any case in which you care? Like, yeah, I mean, you can imagine doing some experiment where, where you, you are doing an active transformation or a passive transformation, and and it really does matter. Um, most of what we'll be interested in here is the question, questions like, is this the effect? <coughs> in which case, then it really, it really doesn't matter. Um, but you're right. So, you know, it's one of those subtleties that you could ignore until you maybe stumble across a situation where, where you have to. Okay. Are there other questions before I attempt an explanation? Okay. So, 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 so th this is the way I, I think about it. Consider that you have a temperature field, because you know it's, it's nice and physical. And the temperature field is such that you know it's lukewarm everywhere, but over here it's really hot. Okay, so there's just a hot patch just here. And now we do a Lorentz transformation on this temperature field, and what we're actually going to do is just a rotation. But it's an active rotation, which means I actually take the whole field and I uh, and I move it. Okay, that's what's meant by an active rotation. So I I had my initial field with a hot patch here. And now what I'm going to do is, is rotate this field so the hot patch is now over there. Okay. Initial field gets rotated to the new field. And now I want to write the new field in terms of the old field. Okay. So in particular, the new field should be such that it's hot over there. So I want the value of the new field to be hot when x is over there, but in terms of the old field, I've got to take x over there and go back to where I came from over here. And it's that going back which is, it's, which is why there's a lambda to the minus one. Okay, please. It's kind of like the only really robust system that talks about this You write, you know, f of x minus a. Yeah, it's, prob it's probably exactly I mean, the same. Whether you're moving the function or the coordinates. Yeah, ex exactly. Active versus passive. It's exactly that. Okay, good. Everybody's happy with that. Is everybody happy with a passive one? Hmm? That's just 
passive. So a passive one is, is where is where you're just um, you're not changing the field, you're just changing the, the labeling of the right. coordinates, so the, and then there'd be a lambda then on the coordinate axes. Yeah, exactly. Right. So quite one so phi prime and phi are different objects. I mean, you're saying then that you're talking about a different field. I, I'm talking about, you know, I have some initial field configuration, yeah. and I'm an all-powerful deity who can move the field in the entire universe. So I do that, and this is where the... Okay, we will go. I, in some sense, you know, doing an active transformation on fields is... You've got to be big to do the whole, the whole <laughs> field, right? So somehow it, it's not quite as intuitive as doing an active transformation in part. Okay, good. So that's how it, um, <coughs> that's how the, the scalar field transforms. As I said, later we'll come across other fields that have indices here, and then those indices will also be acted on by particular matrices that are related to, to lambda. Okay, but we'll see them as we, as we progress. Um, so that's how it acts, um, but that's how it acts on any field. What we're interested in are theories, particular theories, which are invariant under Lorentz transformation. So a theory is said to be Lorentz invariant whenever I've said this in the, in the most concise way, but basically a theory is Lorentz invariant whenever, if you have one solution to the equations of motion, so not just any field configuration, but in particular a solution, and you act on that with a Lorentz transformation, then it's still a solution. Okay? That's what we mean by a theory being, being Lorentz invariant. Yeah. Then that doesn't require that it be have the exact same representation, just that it gives the same, it, that it solves, it, they're both solutions and both make the same prediction. Means that you can, they can look different out here. Look different. I mean, in the sense, in the sense, the temperature being hot over there instead of here looks different. Or well, yeah. So I mean, that could still be invariant, even though not Oh, good. No, I, I think this is this is a good question. The theory is invariant, even though particular configurations are not necessary. Right. So yeah, you're exa you're exactly right. In a particular configuration, you would you might say would break the symmetry. Temperature being hot over here breaks rotation invariant. But the theory itself is rotation. Okay. I mean, you know, it's true in the universe in general. With our laws of physics are translationally invariant, but obviously this room is not translation. Okay. Uh, the final sentence, sorry, says that we can ensure that this is true, meaning that the theory of Lorentz invariant. Man, my writing sucks. But by requiring that the action S is invariant. Okay, so as a little exercise, um, I want I want you to, to check this in, in the tutorial session. Uh, so let me just write this down. So exercise. Check this. Lagrangian that we saw yesterday, which is which gives rise to the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay. 
So what, what does it mean that the actions are variable? It means that for any field configuration, I can evaluate the action, and that gives me a number. Now, what I ask is that, is that if I was to change that field configuration uh, by a Lorentz transformation, I would get exactly the same number for that new configuration. Okay. Okay. So, so you, sh you should run through this, and you know it's a little bit subtle thinking about what what you mean by the derivatives. Are they derivatives of x, or are they derivatives acting on? It's handy to call this whole object here y. And then you've got to change the measure from integration over x to integration over y, and so on. Um, it's actually all done in detail in the notes. So if you, if you want to sort of try it yourself, and then if you get stuck, pick it up. Okay. okay, so so it's really the kind of exercise you should do just once, because in practice, it's dead easy to see if these actions are Lorentz invariant because of this brilliant index. Notation. All you've got to do is make sure the mu's and the news are contracted in some nice way, and that, that's enough to guarantee that it's it's the right thing. You know, as long as you've not got any extra time derivatives hanging around or something. Yeah, then you're fine. Is that in, what's the subscript on the first curve? They're both mu. So, oh, well, okay. I've just, uh, and this is raised with my cost unit. Thanks for the means for 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 example, you did a second exercise. Uh, of working out the equations of motion from a Lagrangian yesterday. That, that, that Lagrangian had first order time derivatives and second order space derivatives. It's clear that that's not what it's The t and the x are completely Okay, questions about, about this? Yeah, that, that transformation is only good for scale. Only good for scalars, yeah. Otherwise, there's extra indices hanging around here, and you have to get extra matrices that, that, that sit in front. And, and we'll come across them. Let, let me just give you one, because I'm, I don't want to tease you too much. Um, so an example of a Lorentz transformation on a vector field And you've, you've, you've come across this vector field A mu in Maxwell's equation. So how does A mu transform Sorry for you guys at the back. Um, so the x index transforms in exactly the same way because that, that's this active versus passive deal. But you know, there's also now a rotation here where the mu index get, gets rotated, okay, w which is what you would expect, right? This is telling you the direction that the field's pointing in, and you do the rotation, and now it's pointing in a different direction. That, that's all this is telling us. Yeah, if you have a bunch of mu and new indices, it's dead easy, right? Yeah. However, there are other more interesting indices you could have, spinner indices, okay. which I think Malcolm mentioned briefly at the end of the right. yeah, So we'll, we'll do all that in detail. In that case, are they the same matrix, the lambda? Yeah, so the, yeah, exactly. Please. So I'm a bit confused between the inverse transformation and the, the Lorentz transformation because I suppose that A subscript mu is uh, like a, not, a, not a vector. A subscript mu. This is a vector, absolutely. Yeah, it's a vector field, but it's, it's a vector at every single point in space. I was expecting the component of a vector to be the higher, maybe eight upper subscript superscript mu. Oh, you're worried about things being up and down? Yeah. And, the, 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 and the transformation, whether it's inverse or it's the transformation. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, the up and down here is not as big an issue as it, as it is in general relativity. There's minor signs that, 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 that crop up. Um, but, but this is. This is right. I mean, we could probably do it for a, ve a vector field that's big here and points in that direction. And then we do this rotation over there. Okay. So now it's, it's big over there but points in this direction. And if you figure out what that means, that then this lambda to the minus one moves you back and this lambda is the right, the right rotation. See, I told you, privacy of your own home. It's, uh, it, it, it's puzzling. Uh, other, yeah, please. Sorry. So, 
in, oh, I guess any theory, like the, you'll have like these objects, like mathematical objects, like in this case, these fields, which are functions on something like R4. Mm -hmm. And um, you have some sort of like solution condition that says like which things are like physical solutions and which aren't. Yes. We have an equation of motion right. with which, which yeah. well, classical I mean, solutions. Yes. Of course, I mean, in this case, you actually don't have an equation, right? Because your condition is that it's a local minimum of the uh, action. That gives rise to a, with, but if I give you an action, you right. get a. But I mean, it's not equivalent to the Euler Lagrange equation. Because you could have, like, you can have maxima that are also solved for a little bit equation, for example. Oh, sorry. So the correct condition is not that it's a minimum, it's that it's an extremum. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Sorry, th this, this principle of least action yeah. complete this moment. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, actually, it's never a maximum. It's always a, it's nearly always a sound point. Yeah. Really? Oh, that's weird. Okay. Um, anyway. So the point is, like, you, so typically, like, you do these transformations, and the equation of motion stays the same. And the mathematical objects, like in this case, the functions from R into R, or whatever, change. Yeah. Yeah. So Lorentz invariance means that it's invariant under the solution. And you can, I assume, there's also an equivalent picture where the objects stay the same in the equation of motion. Or I'm sorry, yeah, the equation of motion changes when you do transformations. about symmetries. So we've, we've set up the scene that we're primarily going to be interested in Lagrangians, which are, or theories, which, which are Lorentz invariant. Um, but now what we want to do is, is, is think about more general symmetries. Um, and in particular, this beautiful result, which you've probably seen in classical uh, mechanics, uh, about the relationship between symmetries and conserved quantities. So this is Noether's theory. Is there anybody here who hasn't seen Noether's theory in classical mechanics? Okay. So, symmetries and Noether's theory. Okay, so if anything, I, I, I would say that in, in field theory, the role of Noether's theorem is even more important than, than it is in, uh, uh, in, in classical mechanics. So certainly the amount of different symmetries you can have in field theories are much greater. So you can have standard things like translational invariance and Lorentz invariance, but there's also various internal symmetries that you can have. There's gauge symmetries, which are very important in, um, uh, in the standard model. Uh, there's things like supersymmetries, which, which you'll probably get to, I don't know, maybe after Christmas. Um, and each of these comes with a conserved object. So what I'd like to do here is tell you the statement of Noether's theorem, explain why it's important, prove it, and then give you a bunch of examples for the rest of, rest of the class. Okay. okay, so Noether's theorem is the following. And it's, it's slightly different for a field theory than, from, than, for a, um, uh, than for particle mechanics. So it's that every continuous symmetry of the Lagrangian gives rise a conserved current okay, so in particle mechanics this would be conserved quantity here it's slightly different it's a conserved current so what's 
meaning of a conserved current? Well, it, it's that when the equations of motion hold, then the current obeys the following equation. Second. I guess I'm partial, yeah. Yeah, actually that's important. Yeah. No, I, the mu and the mu are both up, so this just oh. means sum over it, and, and so you know, as long as this is defined with the i up, it's, it's good. Sorry. Uh, other questions? Okay, so, so let me just walk you through some of the consequences of uh, of this kind of current equation. Um, so the first thing to say is that if we have an equation like this, we do have a conserved quantity. So a conserved current implies the existence of a conserved quantity, which is usually called a charge. All you do is you take you take the zeroth component of the current, you integrate it over all of space, but not of time, and you're left with something which doesn't change in time. Okay, Callum. Symmetry of the Lagrangian. Do you mean function or action? What I really mean is uh, is is action, and this will become clearer later. I mean symmetry of the Lagrangian, but then there's a caveat about total derivatives. Mm -hmm. and that means, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we'll get to this in the example. Okay. <coughs> so to see that this is true, let's just do the obvious thing and take the time derivative. We take the time derivative, we use the, uh, the current equation to replace the time derivative of j with the, um, uh, the spatial derivative of j, but this is now just a total derivative. So as long as there's nothing escaping at the boundary, yeah, please. So is this um, only for scalar fields? Like, would, would the j be a different kind of object? Um, no, j is always going to be a, a vector, regardless of what field configuration. That this holds for any Lagrangian of any field. Other questions? Can we assume in general that j will go to zero as I supposed to infinity? Yes, apart from the situations where it doesn't. <laughs> you know, I, this will happen a lot in field theory. I'm going to assume certain things. And it could be that, that later you know, you'll have to replace this with, there'll be caveats for everything else. Um, okay, so, so we have a conserved quantity. We can calculate this thing Q. Um, again, we've got to be some, some all-seeing omniscient being to, to do that because we integrate over, over all of space to to get Q, so you've got to count up everything in the universe, and then you know that at some later time, 
that thing's going to remain unchanged. Okay? But there's actually something um, more powerful about this current equation, which tells you that charge is conserved locally as well. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that, that the charge in this little box is going to remain the same, because you know, nothing could happen then. But what it means is that if there's some charge in a little box, if it's going to leave that box, it's got to leave through the sides. It's not just going to suddenly disappear and appear over here. Okay? So we can just, we can just see this uh, very easily. Um, Stronger the charge is conserved locally. So to see this, consider some fixed volume in space that I'll call V and define QV just to be the integral over that volume. Of the zeroth component of the current. So if I just repeat this analysis. That's on this board here. And what I get is that the variation of the charge in this volume is equal to grad of J integrated over this volume. Again, it's a boundary term. And the fact it's a boundary term means that if this is going to change, which it can, it's only going to change by something flowing out the side of the box. Okay, so you, you write the change of Q as uh, the integral over the, the uh, boundary of the box, which I've called A, J dotted with DS. Okay? So, so that, that's as good as you're going to get for some local conserved charge. You, you don't want that something in a given box is just going to stick, just going to stay there because you can make that box arbitrarily small and you know, then nothing's going to happen. So things can move, but things have to, have to move locally for this, this conserved charge. Okay. okay, so the next step is to prove Noether's theorem, but, but are there any questions before I do that? Please. T is basically that statement, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, then this is this is just sort of just having that out into the equation sort of differential. <coughs> okay, so let's prove Noether's theorem. And you know, it's a, it's a it, it's the same proof as it. Sorry. So. When you write like del A, um, J, A, is this the contraction of the derivative of A? Or I'm sorry, can, can you think can you think of the contraction of like del A, J, B? Del A, J, B. On its two indices. So what was del A? I, I had, I, so, so you, mean, you mean this thing here? Or no, you wrote at the very beginning del A, J, A equals zero. Del A. Yeah, it's just still mute. Huh? Oh, yeah. okay. This? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is summing over these indices. Right. Time derivative of J0 plus spatial derivative of Ji. Okay. Other questions? Okay, let, let's prove this. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to take our symmetry, you know, something like a rotational symmetry moving from here to here, but, but we're going to work infinitesimally. Okay, so we're just going to consider a little tiny rotation. There was an important word in the statement of Noether's theorem, which was that for any continuous symmetry, 
we get this conserved current. So that's where the continuous comes in. I can, it makes sense to talk about a little tiny infinitesimal uh, piece. For example, parity symmetry. You know, you look at yourself in a mirror and physics is roughly the same. That's not a continuous symmetry. It doesn't give rise to a current because you can't sort of flip yourself over a little bit. You need this sense of continuity. Please. Is there an analogous theorem for discrete? And the symmetries are still powerful, but much less. You, you, you could say, for example, that a particular quantity picks up a minus sign under parity or doesn't pick up a minus sign. Uh, things like that have to match on the inside of the equation. But certainly good so. Other questions? Okay, so we're going to work infinitesimally. And again, this, this is where we're making use of that statement of a continuous symmetry. And OK, so we take a, an arbitrary collection of fields. They're going to translate to some under the symmetry to some new collection of fields. But because this is an infinitesimal symmetry, it's going to be fairly close to where we started. OK, so th this is the, the small little change of the field. I'm not specifying anything about it, just that there is a change of the field at order epsilon. There'll be higher order terms, epsilon squared and so on. We'll, we'll just ignore them. OK, so let me just let me just now define really what I meant by a symmetry, which, which I only sort of did in passing before. What I mean is that if I, if I take the fields, any field at all doesn't have to solve the equation of motion in particular. And I shift them by this amount, then the Lagrangian density doesn't change at all. Okay, it's the same function, the Lagrangian density. Callum raised the caveat earlier. Um, we're going to weaken this requirement shortly. But, but for now, let's just assume that. Okay. okay, so so now comes sort of the little bit of gymnastics. So consider making an arbitrary transformation. So this isn't necessarily the, the particular transformation that's a symmetry. This is that you've got some field and you just vary it in any old way that, that you see fit. Okay, so this is any transformation that you like. Well, how does the action change? We did these calculations yesterday when deriving the Euler-Lagrange equations. The action depends on phi and the derivative of phi. So the change in, sorry, the Lagrangian depends on phi and the derivative of phi. So the change in the Lagrangian has two pieces, one where phi changes, one where the derivative of phi changes. And then we sort of well, we sort of integrate by parts, except that we're not integrating. So we're just sort of rewriting things.
Okay, so is this clear? It's exactly the same step that we were doing deriving the Euler Lagrange equations. So, so let's just remember how do we get the Euler Lagrange equations? We ask that the change in the action is, is zero. The action is extremized. When we do the Euler Lagrange equations, we insist that this term vanishes because um, there's an integral here and that this vanishes at the ends. And that leaves us with the equations of motion that have to vanish. Here we're doing something different, though. We're not going to insist that this term vanishes. We haven't, we haven't imposed any requirement that, that you know, at, at any point at all, the symmetry shouldn't act. Okay, the symmetry is going to act the field configuration everywhere. Instead, we're going to reverse the logic. Remember, Nertus theorem said that when the equations of motion hold, then there's a conserved current. Okay. So we assume the equations of motion hold, which means we lose this term immediately. Okay. So when <coughs> the equations of motion hold, then for any variation, the change in the action is always of this form. It's always a total derivative. Okay, is that, is that, is that clear? So we have any arbit, we have a, a field configuration that we're changing everywhere. And if that field equation happened to obey the equations of motion, the change of the action is of this form. Um, okay, if you're gone, just step one up. Okay, so you just like write down a field and say it doesn't obey the. Yeah, any, any arbitrary field. You know, um, yeah. Say how it evolved in time. Chances are, if you were to write down any arbitrary field configuration, it's not going to obey the equation. But, so, but like those fields would have been anything to do with quantum field theory or physics? Um, they, 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 they would. Okay. In fact, in the interesting parts of quantum field theory, they're, they're actually the ones that are important. Um, again, we'll, we'll get okay. so, first, first. so, I don't, are we using script L for the Lagrangian or for the um, total action? Script L is the Lagrangian, sheet, the Lagrangian density. It's the thing that you integrate over all of space and time to get the action. Okay. Okay, so we have some field configuration. If that field configuration obeys the equations of motion, the Lagrangian density changes in the following way under any arbitrary transformation. Okay? But now, suppose The, con the transformation we're considering, just make sure I got this right. Oh, we're good. Suppose the transformation we're considering is the symmetry. Okay, so when the equations of motion hold, this is the change of the Lagrangian for any transformation. But if that transformation is a symmetry, by definition, the Lagrangian doesn't change. In which case, this thing here has to vanish when this is the particular transformation which is a symmetry. Okay? That means that we've got d mu of something which we'll call j mu is equal to zero, where j mu is, is this object in brackets here. Okay. Th this proof of Noether's theorem is 
does something very unusual for proofs in mathematics. It's usual that you have a proof in mathematics that tells you the existence of something, the existence of a current in this case. This does much more. It tells you the existence of a current and it tells you what it is. Th this is really why it's so powerful. You actually get to construct the current from this proof. Please. Why does energy density have to be zero everywhere? That, that's the definition of a symmetry. I take any configuration, I, thought so. I, I change it by a symmetry, and, and the Lagrange density stays the same. Why can't you have a symmetry which changes the action everywhere, or changes the Lagrangian density everywhere, but does not change the total action? Changes the Lagrangian density everywhere, but like doesn't change the on, the... on the left part, it increases the Lagrangian density, on the right part, it decreases the Lagrangian density. Oh, because you can always... No, because it's going to be true for any field configuration. Okay. Right, so I, right, yes. I think okay. you just can't, can't do it. You could maybe cook it up for one, but in general... Yeah. Like, Uh, where did you use the epsilon is small? When I was writing the, the um, writing the initial part, when I do the do the rotation. Well, it, that's when you said epsilon is small. But yeah. Where did we wind up? But, but basically, it's, it's everywhere. The fact that I I can linearize the, the transformation. There's delta L's everywhere. V right. zero. Okay. You 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 can you can go through it for. Um, Yeah, you, you, for, for simple examples, you, you can go through for the global transformation. Even, even in particle mechanics, I seem to remember when I was teaching it, if you do full sort of finite rotations in particle mechanics, even that's a real pain in the ass to get the conserved particle and the element. So even there, especially, you can do it. Well, I was, yeah, I was just, it, it was clear to me that we had assumed that as long to be small, but just I didn't see immediately where we had yeah, everywhere. Del delta yeah. L is equal to uh, it's, it's, it's just running through the um, there was a question. Yeah, I was just wondering why you left out this. Oh I, I put an epsilon here, but this is just some constant. So so okay, J mu equals epsilon this is concerned. Let me just get rid of the epsilon. It's still something which obeys this. So there's an epsilon sitting outside here. Is there a clear relationship between this and killing vectors? Um, there's, there's almost certainly a relationship. Um, yeah. What, what I'm going to do now is tell you about the killing vectors of Minkowski space and what conserved quantities we, we can get out of them. Um, so if you had some general background, you would again get some conserved quantities for a field living on that. Um, is there an implicit summation on A? In the there, yeah, there's an implicit summation on A. Right. Okay. And, and here as well. All, all the fields that are involved in C. Um, do, you, do you have a question? So why does it mean that we can, we can uh, neglect the, the, the issue of adding a small epsilon, the field value with a very small epsilon instead of just putting epsilon uh, that uh, by just because we see that the and this, if I'd have assumed that this was just small by definition, there wouldn't have been an epsilon. But I just sort of wanted to make it. I was working infinitesimally though, and whatever I put here has to be the infinitesimal. Uh, I'm going to set an exercise on this, um, and and we'll, we'll see. We'll get to the end. There'll be epsilons, but we'll strip them off. Um, we, we, we can see more clearly that when we get, because we can actually construct this, you know, we have specific examples, we have it in front of us, we can just check that the equation of motion indeed of a So we'll do these exercises. Sure. Um, other questions? Um, it's, epsilon is um, independent of space time. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, just a constant. It's important. Okay, th there's a slight generalization that, that Callan, Callan brought up earlier. So, so let me just mention this. Um, so slight
So we can weaken what we require for a symmetry. Okay, so suppose that I had a particular symmetry that I act on the fields with, and I find that actually the Lagrangian didn't stay the same, but it changed by a derivative of, of some function f mu. Okay, Th this is what Callum brought up earlier, because this means that the, the action, which is the integration over all of space of this, will be invariant because the change is a total derivative, which will just, just vanish. Yeah, I'm going to assume things like that throughout. Yeah. yeah. And th th there are particularly interesting field configurations where things don't <coughs> die off at infinity. They're, they're called solitons. Um, and they, they play an important role in condensed matter in particle physics. And, and then you have to revisit some of these, these issues in that context. You sometimes get extra terms to conserve quantity, things like this. Okay, anyway, if, if this is true, it's clear that we can just take the proof through because now delta L is still equal to this, but the symmetry requires that it's equal to this, which means that means that we can still construct, a still construct a conserved current. It's the thing we had before, but this is equal to d mu f mu. So if I just subtract off the d mu, d, the d mu f mu, then I've still got a conserved current. I have a feeling I'm not going to be cons completely consistent about epsilons appearing and disappearing from the equation. So we will, we will see you in the next examples. Yeah. It's not immediately clear to me why we can weaken our requirement of symmetry to this. Oh, so what I wanted was, was the following. I wanted to say that Given a symmetry, where I'm going to define a symmetry in however way I want, but let me, for example, define it in this way, then if the equations of motion are obeyed, I can construct a J mu which satisfies D mu J mu. Okay. So what I had before is, is that... Um, I, mean, I, I see how the, how the math comes out, oh, but, good. But, I, I, but I don't know why... Well, why, why this is something... But we are why that is something significant. Oh, it's, it's because of what, what Callum said. That I'm not asking that the Lagrangian is invariant, but I am asking that the action is invariant. So, so, so there's a, a one-line way of saying it. action is invariant on this machine. So this is sort of related back to my previous question. So if you had a, a field that didn't obey equations of motion, what does the Lagrangian mean? The oh, it's, 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 it's a functional of the field configuration. So you, for any field, you, you can... Uh, you can plug it into the Lagrangian and get a new function. You can then integrate that function over space and get a number, the action. Okay, but is it good for anything if you don't have it, if it doesn't give you a equation? Yeah, the constant theory is extremely important. Let, let, me, let me just go ahead and ask the question twice. This is really what you're going to see in um, the next quantum field theory course in three weeks' time. Okay. But you, you've seen half integrals. So what's a half integral in quantum mechanics? It's, it's where you don't just consider the path, the particle to follow its classical trajectory from here to here, but you consider it following all the trajectories weighted with e to the i times, times the action. So in quantum field theory, you've got to do the same thing. You've got to integrate over all possible field configurations weighted with e to the i times the action. Now, in certain cases, that integral will be dominated by something close to the... Um, to the classical 
solution to the classical equation of motion. Th those cases are what we call weak coupling in quantum field theory, it's where perturbation theory works, and we can do this. However, all the really interesting stuff is when, when that doesn't happen. When that part of the is dominated by field configurations that are a long way away from the, uh, the classical equations of motion. So QCD, confinement of quarks inside the protons due to wildly varying field configurations. Other questions? Sorry to expand on the tangent, but um, presumably then there's some analogous with the equation. It, oh, never mind, I'll ask later. <laughs> you get Good, so I'm, I'm just going to push on and give you some examples about how Nurtis theorem works for specific So we're going to do a bunch of examples. Um, okay, so, so remember in you know courses on classical particle mechanics that there's this beautiful relationship between uh, homogeneity in time, time translations, and, and energy, the conserved quantity energy. And similarly, uh, invariance in spatial translations and the conserved quantity that we call momentum. So there's going to be something very similar that, that appears here, and we're going to, to now derive what those quantities are. Okay. So consider, so these are the space and time coordinates, and we're just going to consider the translation by some infinitesimal amount epsilon mu in either space or time, one of the directions. Okay, we know how all the fields trans transform because it's just Taylor's expansion. But but all my the rest of my notes have the plus sign, so so we may have to <laughs> struggle through and fix that minus sign everywhere. <laughs> Let me do this. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, okay. So if the Lagrangian. has no explicit x-dependence okay so the Lagrangian is also a, f a function of x but it's a function of x as phi is a function of x but any function of x is going to shift in the same, same way. Notice that, that this sits in the, uh, the, the class of the slight generalization. Under the translations, L isn't invariant, but L shifts by a total derivative. Okay. So what we're going to get is four conserved currents So four, because we've got four different transformations here, because we're in four-dimensional Minkowski space. This index here goes zero, one, two, three. And we know exactly what they are. What they are is the following, just from reading off from, from Noether's, uh, Noether's theorem. So, so let me just um, walk you through the notation here. 
Um, this is the current, okay? So the mu index at the top there is the, the, uh, the mu index that we already saw in, um, in Noether's theorem. This new index here, this new index that's new, it is the thing that goes 0, 1, 2, 3, because we have four different currents that we're, we're computing. Okay, so, so, but because this is a rather special current, translations in space and time, the two indices go over the same, the same, uh, the same range. Okay, so, so this is just reading off the current from Noether's theorem. This, this was the first part, and this is what we called F mu here. And if you just look at what F mu is, it's basically uh, the Lagrangian itself with this delta mu mu index. This is a rather special object in, in quantum field theory. It's, it's got a name. It's usually written in the following way. So th this obeys. This equation, which is just this current equation we've already seen. And T is called the energy momentum tensor. You'll sometimes hear other names for it. The stress energy tensor, sometimes just the stress tensor. Um, it's nearly always called T. Fair question? Uh, GR last week. Mm. Uh, is this T the same T that you'd see in the Einstein equation? Not, not yet, but I am going to, to explain how the relationship is. Okay. Okay, so we've got four conserved currents, so four conserved quantities. Okay, so, so the conserved quantities are always the integral over space of the zeroth component of, of the current. So we've got four possibilities, whether the other index takes uh, its value at zero or whether the other index takes its value in space, i equals one, two, three. So just to give you some feel for this, If we take this uh, Lagrangian that gives rise to the Klein-Gordon equation, we plug in those, uh, that expression for the stress energy tensor, T mu nu, it's given by the following. And in particular, we can now calculate the energy and the momentum. Okay, so again, th these are two conserved quantities uh, associated to the entire field. I mean, that nothing uh, uh, nothing local, the entire field. And you can see that you know, the nice thing has happened that usually happens 
um, in, uh, in classical mechanics, which is that the minus signs that we're here for the Lagrangian get flipped to plus signs, and then the energy is the sum of the kinetic energy plus the gradient energy plus, plus the potential energy. Okay? But again, integrated over all of space, so, so uh, summing this up everywhere in the field. And similarly, the momentum is, well, it's given by the following integral. The momentum sort of, you, know, you, you can see from this expression, it's kind of telling you how much the field is going in that direction. Okay, so it has this, uh, the correct feel of momentum to it. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay, so uh, I think I'll stop in tomorrow. What I'm going to do is, um, is, is, is answer Callum's question, tell you how this T mu nu is related to the one that you see in, in general relativity. Um, in fact, for a scalar field, this is the T mu nu that appears in general relativity. Um, but for other fields, there, there's some subtleties. Um, and then I'm going to walk you through various other examples of, of conserved currents in, in field theory. Okay.